Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You know, I really would love to tell some wonderful jokes this morning in the message. But John Winfield stole all of them from me last night. So I don't have any funny jokes to tell. But uh, I'll tell you what, I appreciate everybody who's a part in that. Uh, you put that together. The, the uh, food was delicious. The decorations were awesome. The musical entertainment from Elvis Presley was phenomenal. The uh, jokes, the dancing, the laughter, that's fun fellowship, isn't it? And appreciate y'all uh, taking part in, in ministering to the rest of us in that way. Well, folks, this morning we're going to dive back into the book of Acts. What is so important about the book of Acts? Well, there's a lot that's important about the book of Acts. But uh, it, it was recorded, the, the book of Acts records Jesus' plan and the beginning of the construction of his church. See, when Jesus came to this earth, he had a mission. And his mission was what? To seek and to save the lost. And he died on the cross and he rose from the grave to seek and to save us. And after he ascends into heaven, he's not done with his mission. His mission continues in and through the disciples of the early church. So the church was born on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 with a very specific mission. Luke wrote the, the gospel of Luke, recorded the life and ministry of Jesus. And then he wrote the book of Acts to go along with it, which records what happens after Jesus' ascension. So as we study Acts, we see that mission going forward. We begin to understand our place in that mission. It's often been called the Acts of the Apostles because it records the words and deeds of the Apostles, but really it should be called the Acts of Jesus through the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Acts is a continuation of Jesus' mission. His plan, His mission carried out by us. This morning we're going to turn to Acts chapter 5. I would encourage you to turn to Acts 5. And we see what the mission of the church is all about and the kind of impact God can make in people's lives when we, the church, are living on mission. Then we pick up in Acts 5. Remember the church is still very young. At the end of chapter 4, last year when we were finished up where we were in Acts chapter 4, we saw that uh, the church was filled with examples of generosity and ministry in the church where people were, were taken, if they had property, then sell part of that property like Barnabas did and, and take and put the money at the apostles' feet so they could give to those in the church who had needs. And then we also saw in the beginning of chapter 5 an example of the exact opposite thing going on in the church where was, there was this man named Ananias and his wife named Sapphira and they had some land and they sold the money and they took the money, they took part of the money and laid it at the apostles' feet like Barnabas. They said they just laid a part to be shared out among the brothers and sisters but they claim that that was all of the money. So, so they took a portion of the money for themselves, and they only gave a small part, but they said, this is all the money. Now, why did they do that? <laughs> Greed. They wanted to keep money for themselves. They wanted to get a reputation that they were very generous and loving. And so they were more concerned with their reputation instead of actually having a heart for God's people. And so they thought they could lie, not only to God's people, but to God. And what happened with Ananias? Peter calls him in and says, hey, was this the money that you sold the land for? The Holy Spirit told Peter there's a problem. And Ananias says, oh, yes, that's the money. That's what we sold the property for here. All the money is the churches. And Peter said, you haven't lied to me, and you lied to God. You're dead. And he falls down dead because who strikes him dead? God. A supernatural interaction right there. Boom, you're dead. They carry him out. The men who carry him out, they're coming back into the tent place. Their feet are right there at the door. And in comes Sapphira, his wife. And, and Peter says, 
Now listen, uh, was this the money that y'all made from the sale of the land? And she says, yes. yes. He says, why have you not made a lie? Not just the men. You, your husband conspired to lie to God. And God does what? He strikes her dead. Supernaturally strikes her dead right there. And so those men come in and get her and carry her out and they bury her. And they think that's a big deal. What do you, how would you respond if something like that happened in Adam's chapter? Keith, is that all the money that you... Oh, yes, it is. Keith, oh, oh, no. But just imagine what that would be like to, to actually experience that. Well, God strikes this husband and wife dead as an example to the rest of the church that they need to know this is for real. This Jesus thing, this body that he calls us to be a part of is a real thing. It's serious. It's not like a social club where you can you know, just play along and, and not have your... No, no, it's a real serious thing. And it's also, God did that as a testimony to the community outside of the church that this is a real deal. This isn't just a social club. This isn't just a place where people come because they believe the same thing and hoorah, happy us. No, God is in these people's midst. And it's a serious thing to follow Jesus. So that's what's going on. The church is for people who believe in Jesus and take their relationship with him very seriously. They know they can't lie to him. The church is not for perfect people or people who think they're perfect would be better to be said. That's not who the church is for. If you think you're perfect or you want to put out there that you're perfect, the church isn't for you because you're not. I'm not perfect, nor are you. None of us is. It's not for people who want to put on a show like they believe. For, for you to come in and, and, and sing the songs and bow your head when the prayer is going, but you're just thinking about the football game and you could care less about these songs, but you're just putting on a show for the family or for your friend or just you just putting on it. The church isn't for you if that's who you are. The church is about Jesus and Him being among His people and people who hunger and desire for a relationship with Him. People who know they're not perfect. People who know they need a Savior. That's who the church is for. In Acts chapter 5, verse 12, right after Ananias and Sapphira, it says, At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. Now, we're going we're gonna to read more about these signs and wonders in a minute. The reason God gave the apostles the ability to do signs and wonders, these miracles, was why? To verify the message of the messenger. When the Jewish people saw them performing miracles and them preaching about Jesus, it would cause a lot of people to believe what, what they're hearing. And come to Christ. And the church will be born. So that's why they were given those miraculous abilities at the beginning of the church. So the church is gathered in Solomon's portico in unity. This is a part of the temple complex. I think it was on the east side of the court of, uh, of uh, the, 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 uh, one of the courts. I can't remember the specific one. But it's, it's a colonnade. It's, it's full of these columns just lined along there. A lot of room for the thousands of members of the early church to gather there together to worship. And they're worshiping together. They're hearing the preaching of the word. But in verse 13, it says something quite interesting. It says, none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. A couple of things here. First of all, none of the rest dared to associate with them. And then secondly, the people held them in high esteem. What in the world is going on? Why don't the rest of the people dare associate with the church in Solomon's portico? Well, news had gotten out what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Did you hear what happened to that husband and wife? Right there in the church, right there in the worship service, right there. And God struck them dead. That's serious business. It is not safe to go to that church. 
It's not safe to be with those people. The, the, the folks in the community recognize these people. God was serious about his church and the mission of the church. And, and they're scared to hang out with these people. Scared to go to church. This is why when the church gathered, there weren't a bunch of unbelievers just hanging out. Because it was serious business. Yet, the people held them what? In high esteem. Why? Because news had gotten out about the healing of a lame beggar by the apostles. And we talked about that when we were earlier in Acts. Word was spreading that this guy was crippled and lame, and yet these apostles, these guys that are preaching about Jesus, they came along and healed this man. He, he's walking just fine. That's a pretty cool thing, isn't it? That's a good deed, isn't it? That they would care about this crippled man and heal him like that. That's amazing. Because word was spreading that those people in the church love one another and they take care of one another and they share their food and their property with those who are in need and, and they come together and pray and, and comfort one another. When somebody's hurting in their fellowship, they care. And that kind of word got out to the community as well. And so when people in the community hear that there's a church like that, how do they hold that church? In high esteem. You get a reputation for being a church. A gathering of people that loves others. That cares about other people. When the church is on mission, Hurting people are helped. Because God cares about hurting people. That's His heart. He cares about people who are suffering, who are being beaten down in this world. He cares about people who feel hopeless and helpless, and He sends us out on mission. And again, when we're on mission, hurting people are helped. Because lost people are found. He says in Acts 5 verse 14, And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Hold on a second now. We just saw that, that people were scared to go be amongst them, and yet they were held in high esteem. Well, how is it then that more and more believers, multitudes of men and women, are constantly added to their number? Well, the answer is that the gospel was getting out. The gospel was getting out. People weren't just coming to where the church was gathered, unbelievers coming there and then hearing the gospel and, oh, I want to be a part of this body. That's not just what was happening. Although some may have done that, what was happening was the church was going out from that place they were gathered into their community. And they went to their home where they had friends and family and, and neighbors who didn't know Jesus, and they told them about Jesus. And as those folks heard about Jesus, and they heard and knew the reputation of the church, they became believers. And when they became believers, where did they go? They went and joined, they went and, and, and joined up with the worship in the church. So the church is growing by leaps and bounds because the mission of the church is Jesus' mission, seeking and saving the lost, and the church was about their business, their master's business. In that day, there was a lot of opposition to the church. The leaders in Jerusalem had just done what to Jesus? They just killed him. They just crucified him. They just buried him. And they did not want the church to grow. They did not want the gospel to spread. They wanted to stamp the church out. But the call to salvation went out anyway, didn't it? And there were a whole lot of people, I'm sure, who heard the call and thought, you know, there's probably something to this gospel. And there's got to be. Look at the way that people love each other. Look at the way they serve people. Look at the miracles they do. But, Following Jesus would mean going against the norms of society. Following Jesus would mean the direction that everybody else in our culture is swimming in. I've got to turn and go against that and go in this other direction. Following 
Jesus would make me a part of a church where, where people might hold me accountable to live a certain way and, and, and I'm supposed to believe a, a, a certain way and following Jesus might cost me something I don't want to give up. And so surely there were people in Jerusalem that heard the gospel as the church went out on mission and they counted the cost and they said what? I'm not willing to pay that. You, you, you be the church and you believe what you want to believe, but I'm going to go with the flow of what everybody else is doing. I don't want that opposition in my life. I don't want to have to struggle with what the leaders here in town are going to say. I don't want to have to struggle with losing business or losing family members who don't accept me because I believe something different than they believe. Today, it's not really popular and easy to follow Jesus. In Eastern North Carolina, we tend to think that, well, yeah, just everybody's a Christian. Not everybody's a Christian. There's a lot of people who are more like Ananias and Sapphira than they are Barnabas or Peter. There are a lot of people who are putting on a show, going through the motions, hanging on at the edges, at the fringes of the church, just kind of dipping their toe in, kind of wondering, and, but not fully committed to the Lord. And if that's you, you're lost. If you've never jumped into Jesus, if you've never been immersed in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you're lost. And our mission as a church is for the lost to be found. Our mission is to introduce you to Jesus. To tell you that He died for you. And you can be forgiven just like all of us have to be forgiven. Who's a sinner? Every single one of us. Jesus died to pay for those sins. You need to be forgiven. So I would encourage you, we would encourage you, if you've never been baptized into Christ, you need to leave it. You need to stop playing games and stop testing the waters. You've done that enough. You've heard the gospel. Do you believe in Jesus or not? And if you do, step forward and accept it. Savior. That's his call to you. Count the cost. Know that this is serious business. Jesus wants to save you from your sins. But when Christ calls a man, he calls him, he bids him come and die. Die to yourself. Die to your sin. What does that mean? That means you are willing to give up anything and everything he calls you to give up to follow him. Because you believe So God worked signs and wonders through the apostles so when they preached, people would believe. Not everybody would believe, but th those who were broken in their sin, those who recognized they needed saving, they would hear that gospel and they would believe. And the lost would be found. Now you might be carrying some baggage from your past that's hurting your heart today. You might recognize that you need to be forgiven. Jesus has the answer because he is the answer. Accept it. When the church is on mission, lost people are found. Are we on mission, church? Let's be on mission. It's not just the Athens Chapel thing. It's the church going out and being on mission. Remember, again, it wasn't just that they were in Solomon's portico and the preacher was preaching and people were coming to hear and believing. No, no. The church went from that place out with the gospel. And when they came back, they brought more with them. Maybe that should be your goal on Sunday. Is that when you come back, you bring more with you. Not so that they can hear me and come to Jesus, but that you would tell them about Jesus. And that they would come. We would rejoice in that. When the church is on mission, another thing that happens is that sick people are healed. 
As all these new people are joining the church, they bring their needs with them. They have needs. And we see in verse 15 that it was such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. They believe that if the apostle Peter, this powerful preacher that had the ability to heal, God gave him that ability, if his shadow would fall on this person who was sick, they would be healed. And so they were bringing them out into the streets. And it says in verse 16, also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem, the surrounding area, were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. God has a heart for hurt people. And His church must have a heart for hurting people. People in the church were coming for healing. People in the community who couldn't find help anywhere else were coming with hope that they would find healing. And people in the church, God was using them to provide healing. You see, the apostles cared. And they went among the sick people, the unbelieving people, and they used their gifts to heal those who were suffering. Now we serve the same God today that they serve then, don't we? Jesus could heal people then, and he can heal people today. I, I have personally known people who were healed through a miracle of God. I've seen it. Most of us in here know of people in this church and or in our families who God has worked a miraculous healing. I, I hear testimonies during man and ministry. When we pray for these folks in man and ministry, I hear testimonies all the time. Well, not all the time, but it's it's not uncommon to hear testimonies of, of, of God working a miracle in somebody's life and provided a healing. It, it's an amazing thing. And I know uh, several years ago, I knew a woman in Rome Rapids who survived a ruptured aorta, the, the main aorta for her heart. She survived that, and all the doctors said nobody survives that. And yet, she did. I believe that was a miracle from the Lord. Uh, we hear testimonies from people who, who share how God has healed them, and we know that there that He answers prayer. You know, we, we know that that we've heard testimonies of cancer disappearing. Y'all you know, remember Wiley, that old crazy dude named Wiley? The doctors told him, "You, you might as well get your affairs in order. You got what three days or something like that to, to live." And we were still waiting for him to die six years later. I'm like, come on, Wiley, come sick. Uh, but the Lord does miraculous things, and he heals people at times, and we don't understand. We don't always understand. But we pray, and we expect the miraculous, if it's his will. And his answer is not always a miracle. In that first generation of the church, God was doing something different. He allowed that first generation of believers to do more miracles through the, the miraculous gifts in order to set the foundation for the church. This is why we don't see as many healings today as happened in the first century. We're not given the gift of healing like they had. Instead, we're called to do what? Pray. We're to pray for those who are sick and to lift one another up for before God and seek healing in that way. And we have seen God answer those prayers with miraculous healing, but ultimately we trust that if God doesn't heal a sickness in this life, one day He will. You know, we prayed for a long time that my dad would be healed of lupus. And yet his lupus never went into remission. It was with him until the day that he left this world behind. But praise God, he's been healed. You don't have to worry about lupus anymore. You know, my mom, we, we prayed for, for years that her dementia would be healed and just miraculously taken away. It never was until she left this world behind. But she's been healed. And they had to worry about dementia anymore. That's an awesome thing, isn't it? We take great comfort and hope in that. And sometimes when we pray and ask for healing, God's answer is okay. And that's an amazing thing to rejoice at, but sometimes his answer is not yet. We pray in faith, knowing that he hears and he cares and he's able. And one day, 
in his perfect timing, he's going to bring healing. Well, how does this relate to the mission of the church? Our heart, again, should reflect God's heart. If he cares when people are hurting and sick, what should we do? We should care too. And we may not be able to, to, I'd love to be able to go into the hospital down there in, in, in Washington and then even go to Greenville and, and walk through the halls and just lay hands on people and make just sick people just get up and, and they're well. I'd love to be able to do that. We're not given that ability. But we can pray for folks. We can pray. And we can show people who are hurting, people who are sick, that we care, maybe by carrying them a, a pot of chicken noodle soup. We can do that. Maybe sending them a card or calling them or crying with them or pointing to Jesus and reminding them of the hope that we have that one day that healing is going to come. Lovingly and gently reminding that person who is suffering that Jesus is the answer. He is the one who comforts when no one and nothing else can comfort. He is the one who has the power to heal when no one else has the power to heal. He is the one who holds the very keys to eternity. We can share that with folks. This is the way that the sick are healed when the church is on mission, when those needs are met in the ways that God allows us to meet them. In the first century, there were literal, physical healings that regularly took place. And those who were healed would believe the gospel and be saved. Today, we share the gospel and we love and we help those who are sick in any way we can in being there and helping and comforting and showing the love of Jesus. And those who receive that love from us, what do you think that does to our testimony about Jesus? When someone's suffering and sick and hurting and you go to them and you love and you have compassion and you help them in any way that you can, how do you think that impacts their faith? It's going to draw them, not just to you, not just to the church, but to the Lord. And that's what we need to be about because the greatest need anybody has is Jesus. So when the church is on mission, the sick are healed. And when the church is on mission, Bound people are freed. Bound people are freed. Look at verse 16 again. It says the people from the cities of the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or what? Afflicted with unclean spirits. They were all being healed. Not only were sick people being brought to be healed, but people who were afflicted with unclean spirits were brought. What does it mean to be afflicted with an unclean spirit? That means you are bound by a demon. It, it's, it's possession. Demonic possession. This is something that people today don't seem to believe can happen. Just it's silly to even think about it. But it is demon possession and we see multiple examples of it in the Bible we know this really happens because nowhere in the Bible does it say, okay, demon possession is not a thing anymore. Don't worry about that, church. That's not what the Bible says. And so we know that it's still a thing. It can still happen today. And I have talked to people who say they've seen it on the mission field. I've talked to several people who have been on the mission field in other countries, and they share things that they have seen, and the only explanation is demonic possession. It is, it's, uh, it, whether it's in Africa or, or South America is a couple that I can remember. Uh, these things that, that are happening. Uh, I, I talked to one uh, preacher, one of, one of my uh, brother preachers here in eastern North Carolina uh, in, in Beaufort County who uh, had seen a person that he went to minister to with a couple of other guys and, and this preacher said that the only explanation he could have is that this person was actually possessed by a demon. I'm not going to tell you what preacher it was, but this is one of the most level-headed guys I know, one of the most serious, mature uh, Christian men that I know. And he's fully convinced that, that he saw somebody possessed by a demon. Long ago, there was a, a great rebellion in heaven. One of the angels decided that he wanted to take God's glory. That he wanted to sit on the throne. 
And so he led a third of the angelic host in a rebellion against God. Now, was this a smart plan? No. I, I cannot imagine seeing the God of all creation on the throne, and you know full well, this is the one who created me and all of us, and this is the one who flung the stars in the sky, and I think that's what he created the angels as well, by the way. And this is the one who created the earth and put everything on the earth. He spoke it into existence. This is the God of all creation to know all of this, to see all of this, and then say, I'm going to take your spot. I can't imagine how a preacher could do that except for pride and jealousy. Pride and jealousy. Pride and jealousy are at the root of the fall of angelic hosts, a third of the angelic hosts. And pride and jealousy are at the root of the fall of many a man and woman. And we'll talk more next week, uh, in two weeks about that, about jealousy touch on that. But God cast these angels down to the earth because they never even had a chance. There was absolutely no chance that they would have any way of hurting him or overthrowing him or anything. He cast these angels down to the earth and these fallen angels become known as demons. Demons. And these demons have the ability to invade a person's mind and have some level of control over their body, over their actions. Now, some of y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy. I promise I'm not crazy. That's what the Bible says. We see examples of it in Scripture. Now, as we look at the New Testament accounts of demonic possession, unclean spirits, we see that delivering people from demons was a regular part of Jesus' ministry, just as healing was a regular part of his ministry and preaching was a regular part of his ministry. Casting out demons was a regular part of his ministry. It was not rare for Jesus to run across somebody who was possessed by a demon. And when the church spread out on mission, it was not rare for the apostles as they're preaching and for others in the church to experience those who run across people who were possessed by a great spirit. Demons. If it wasn't rare, I don't really expect it to be too rare today, although we may not always recognize it today as easily as we should. I want to read one account really quickly here in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus runs across someone who's possessed by an unclean spirit. It says, they came, in Mark 5, verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him. And the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, day and night, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gnashing, or gashing himself with stones. Wow. And you can tell me, well, listen, they were ignorant in Bible times. They didn't really know. This, this, this man had a, a, a mental issue. There was nothing supernatural going on. Yeah, okay. You find somebody with you know, a problem in their thinking that is able to break chains and tear up shackles and that nobody can subdue because they have that kind of strength. It wasn't just something physical going on in that person's mind and they had an issue. There was demonic possession. Okay? What symptoms of demonic possession do we see in Scripture in this example and in others in the Bible we read about people who are unable to speak because of demonic possession that they're not able to speak um, blindness seizures the loss of hearing in cases like the man possessed by demons here in, in Mark 5 and Matthew 8 symptoms uh, are, are the symptoms of demonic possession mimic a severe psychological or psychiatric disorder in some ways. This is the type of person that might be sent away to a place where they can get professional help today because there's actually demonic involvement. 
And, and the things that people are seeing, they say they need to go get medicine, go get help. Does that mean that every person who has a, a problem and, and, and needs psych psychiatric help or needs medicine, does that mean that every situation like that is demonic? No, no, no. Some of these things, uh, are, are, are they, there could be a physical component, simply a physical component, because we live in a fallen world where sin exists and we all have issues. And God has blessed us, especially today, to have the ability to have medications and to have treatments that people might need to deal with these physical issues. But we cannot deny the fact that there are situations where there is demonic activity. And that could be the source in some cases. Uh, the, the, the person is driven to isolate themselves from others in some instances, like with the garrisons, living among the tombs. Uh, in another situation, driven into the deserts by a demon. In another story, dwelling on the mountain away from others. So, so this unclean spirit may drive this person to isolate themselves from others and not be a part uh, of the community. Other signs of possession include nakedness, self-harm, cutting oneself, even inhuman strength, being able to break chains. Does that mean that every person who cuts themselves is because they got a demon? No. Again. But that could be a sign of demonic activity. Now, these are not the only signs or symptoms of, of demon possession. And, and, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying that every person who shows some of these symptoms is it's a demon involved. I'm not saying that. But we, what we see in Jesus' ministry is that people who are sick and need healing, they receive healing. Others are possessed by an unclean spirit and, and, and they need someone to come along and answer their need by casting that demon out. That ministry of healing and that ministry of casting out demons went on in the church and it actually continues today. Now, I don't have time to dive real deep this morning into the idea of spiritual warfare, but if it's something that you want to learn more about and you want to talk more about, uh, uh, two or three years ago I did a sermon series on spiritual warfare. We can get you a copy of that uh, to read or the video copy if, if you want that. So just ask if you're interested in that. But a couple of things I do want to touch on uh, are how a person might become possessed by an unclean spirit and then... What we do, what should we do to help free a person from that spirit? First of all, how, how might a person become possessed by an unclean spirit? Uh, we know that demons tempt us, right? They tempt us. When a person gives in to temptation over and over again, when they obey the calling of the enemy, you're opening the door a little bit and a little bit and a little bit for the enemy to influence and to start influencing your decisions. And as you let the enemy start influencing your decisions, you're opening the door a little bit wider for the enemy to influence even more of your decisions. And if you go down that path logically long enough, what's going to happen? The enemy's going to take over. You're just going to give him control. You're going to cede control by just giving in all the time. And whatever you want, hey, we'll do it. And so that, that's one way uh, that, that you could open yourself up to dumb, dumb, uh, possession. The same thing can happen to those who open themselves up to outside influences through the occult by means of attempting to talk to the dead, you know, going to a seance or, or, or going through a medium or, or uh, doing uh, the Ouija board, that kind of thing. And, and some of you are like, well, my, my parents, my grandparents said the Ouija board was evil. It's just a game. It's not just a game. Amen. You know, uh, I know that I, I sound all fuddy-duddy, but I'm going to tell you, if you have anything to do with the occult, you're opening that door just a little bit. We don't want our kids opening that door. If you got a Ouija board in the closet at home, you can throw it out. Okay, that, that's a, that's yeah, it's just a board. But the, the 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 spirits are trying to destroy you, and they're going to use any means necessary to get your attention and get you off course. So going through mediums, ceremonies, Ouija boards, all this kind of stuff, attempting to talk to the dead through the occult, you open the door 
to let spirits, evil spirits, have some, some influence on them. These types of things are dangerous. Again, because we are surrounded by an enemy who wants to destroy us. Another dangerous avenue to possession is this craze people have today of not being religious, but instead being what? You haven't heard it. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual. And basically what that means is I'm going to treat religion like a buffet and take what I want from where I want. And you know what? I really like the worship songs for this little little religion right here. So I'm going to take these worship songs. And, and you know what? I really like the, the peace that I would get from the meditative stances and things that these people are doing. So I'm going to take these and I'm going to bring these in. And, and all these people talk about karma and you... If whatever you get, you know, if you treat people good, it's going to come back right. Let me take that, and I'm going to make, and I'm going to be this very spiritual, well-rounded person. Okay, we are surrounded again by the enemy who wants to destroy us, to deceive us, to get us off course, and to gain influence in our life. And when you start picking from here and picking from there and picking from there and allowing all these things to influence you. Instead of Jesus and his word, you're opening yourself up to be influenced by the enemy. And our enemy masquerades as an angel of light. These demons don't, don't run around with pitchforks and, and every time you see them, they're trying to stab your eye out. That's not the way they work. But they're, much, they're much happier using the carrot to tempt you than to stick to beat you. They're going to tempt you in and draw you in with things that sound good and look good. And then once they got their hooks in you, that's when they kill you. That's when they destroy you. So in order to put yourself up to influence from, from the demons of hell, unclean spirits, don't do it. Now what do we do? What do we, church, what do we do to free people from an unclean spirit? Jesus gave the apostles the authority, and in the early church, there were people who were given the ability in the first century to cast demons out. Literally, to say to this person who's possessed, to say to them, you get out of that person in the name of Jesus, and guess what the demon did? They left. Okay, they left. Uh, and, and we call that exorcism. And uh, I'm not going to go real deep into that stuff. Uh, I, I think the answer is pretty basic. I think we try to make it too complicated. We need to, first of all, recognize demonic influence in a person's life and call it what it is. We need to have our eyes open and realize that there could be a demonic influence when we see it in front of us. We should, we should be able to recognize that. But the ultimate answer is to bring that person to Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer. So we should pray for them, shouldn't we? Should we pray for them? Yeah. Okay, body quiet. We should pray for them. And we should pray that God would cast that unclean spirit out of that person. We should pray and ask him to do that. And we should gather our brothers and sisters together, gather two or three in his name, and pray and ask God to do that. And God has said, well, two or three are gathered in his name. There I am in your midst. And when we agree together, and we pray for God's will to be done and for God to cast out that demon, I believe he answers those prayers. I believe there's power in prayer. I don't think God wants a person to be possessed by a demon. And so when his church recognizes that's what's going on and we pray against that, I believe God will work. So we pray. We pray for that person to hear and respond to the gospel and for Jesus to, to, to break the hold that that evil, unclean spirit has on them. And we pray in faith, knowing that God is greater than anything, even the darkest demons of hell. That's what we need to do, folks. And then trust God to work. Because He will. Those who are bound by evil spirits can only be freed by Jesus. He is the answer. And when the church is on mission, when we are loving those around us and we're sharing the gospel of Jesus with the lost, we're praying for folks and we're caring for folks, we are going to come face to face with people who are bound by demons. 
unclean spirits. And when we bring the light of Jesus into their lives, the enemy's going to lose ground and God's going to gain ground. The bound will be free. So what's the takeaway today? Well, I'll tell you one takeaway today. You better be happy because this is half of a sermon. I <laughs> uh, prepared this sermon for this morning, and, and I thought I was going to go all the way through pretty much the rest of this chapter. That was my intention. And I got up this morning and I said, you know what? I got too much. We have an hour long message. And what we need to hear is this right here. Church, what we need to hear is a reminder we've got to be on mission. We've got to be on mission. Because when we're on mission, God changes people's lives. He will change your life when you're on mission. He'll change my life. And when we go tell people about Him, He'll change their life. If we don't share them, if we don't tell people about Jesus, they won't be like lost in their sin. So we got a job to do. we got to carry the gospel to lost people. And those who are sick, those who are hurting in this world, we need to be comforting and caring for them as we point them toward Jesus. Will we do that? I hope we will. So ask the Lord this week, ask the Lord to put someone's name on your heart that needs to hear about you. And then go to them and share Jesus with them. This week, encourage and serve someone who is suffering. Look for somebody who's sick, somebody who's struggling, and be there for them. And pray. Pray against demonic influences in the lives of your family and friends. Have your eyes open. The enemy is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy everybody. And he's in eastern North Carolina. The demons of hell are in eastern North Carolina, just like they're in Washington, D.C., just like they're in Cambodia, just like they're in Iraq, just like they're in North Korea and South Korea. <coughs> just like they're here. Pray against them. And look for opportunities to call it for what it is when you see it. And point people to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for being so good to us. We thank you for, for dying for our sins and then calling us to live in relationship to you. You're such a great God. We thank you for the comfort that you bring, the healing that you bring, the hope that you bring. We pray right now, Lord, that you would help us to leave this place, to go out on mission. Help us to, to have that same mission uh, of seeking and saving the lost. That that would be our mission, that you work through us. We want to see you work through us and in us. So we pray for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.